everyone, and welcome to Neuroscience Consciousness and what might be an awkward conversation about the racial divide in America today. Um, welcome, Shay. Uh, we're going to talk to Shay Sun to so say hi. Hi, guys. This is my name is Shay Sun, and thank you, Anne, for having me. Um, I wanted you to say hi so that the Zoom camera went over to you. Yes. So people can see you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Shay. We have been friends for many, many years, and Shay it has been through our program. He is a coach, and so he's been trained in neuroscience and the seven levels and has a wonderful perspective. I want to read you his background because it's actually really fascinating. Shay was born in Seoul, but he's Chinese, and he came to the States when he was two, grew up in the Bay Area, and went to, also went to school in California. Um, he has a BA in English and a master's in intercultural studies, so he's bringing all sorts of expertise to this conversation, <laughs> as well as his own personal experience. Um, I, the reason I laugh is that Shay is just so humble that he doesn't like hold himself out as like any amazing expert, but I hold him that way. So that was what the laugh was about. Um, Shay has many certifications relating to professional development and coaching. He's a certified strengths coach. He's one of our neurotransformational coaches. Um, and he also just completed his 21st year in teaching English um, in middle school, eighth grade English. Um, he has two adopted children from China, Anna, who's now 12, wow, and Timothy, who's eight, and they live in Montana with his ex. Um, I asked Shay to be part of this series, and I asked him to tell me, you know, after I said, would you do that, like, why would you want to? So here's what he said, and then we'll talk to him. As a coach, I help people expand their awareness and effectiveness by transforming their talents into strengths. In other words, I help edify, equip, and empower agents of change. So as a change agent myself and a person of color, this series is personally important because it's so close to home. The actions of the African American community of the past are what led me to come to the States. The struggles and success of one group impact another. In high school, my high school sweetheart of two and a half years was black, and I experienced firsthand racism at school and even within my own family. If there's anything from my personal experiences, they may shed some healing light on the current world I had to accept and compelled to share. So that was really beautiful. Thank you, Shay. Thanks for being here. Oh, thank you, Anne. Thank you so much for having me. Really, really appreciate you. Well, this is sort of a you know, interesting, timely uh, time in the world. We're three weeks out from George Floyd being murdered in Minneapolis. And so I think there's just been lots and lots of conversations. And one of the ones that I was really curious to have was around neuroscience and consciousness. So tell me what that kind of sparks in you. Yeah, so I think when it comes to the seven levels and we talk about uh, frustration, level three, and one of the things I believe you've mentioned and others as well has said that anger is a secondary emotion, yeah. often rooted in either hopelessness or in fear. And oftentimes it's fear. Yeah. And so when I first heard it, I posted something like right when it happened and I posted the, the footage and I just put a big not okay, right? So it was this anger, right? But I think partly there was also a mixture. I think it really was a mixture. It was a mixture of fear for like, I mean, I still talk to my ex-girlfriend, you know, she's still black, <laughs> you know, like she, nothing has changed there, right? And then in terms of my own children being Asian and living in Montana, uh, being very monocultural and things like this. So there's fear definitely in terms of minority groups, but also just a sadness, the fact that so much time has passed now historically, and the fact that we're still dealing with these issues and it's so blatant that it just brings a great deal of sadness as well. Yeah, and I think that can even bring up um... Uh, feelings of hopelessness. And I know you as a, as a middle school English teacher, I know you know Langston Hughes. And I think I've been thinking a lot about that poem, What Happens to a Dream Deferred? Mm. Um, does, it, does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? And then there's some other lines, and I just remember the last one, or does it explode? Yes, yes, no, so definitely. I think you're speaking to, you know, there's so many layers that have gone into the response. Um, what do you think is different, if anything, about this time around? You know, does it still feel as hopeless? Just like, where would you put this response on the seven I level? love the fact that you answered, asked me that question because I felt a little bit hopeless when I was talking to my ex-girlfriend last weekend. We talked for three hours and her response was, nothing is going to change. It will not move the needle. 
And I had to say to her, civil rights, uh, the slavery, people move the needle along the way. But she says, but for me, just personally right now, that's how I feel. That yeah. this is no different than Rodney King. There's no difference than, than all of these other experiences in the past. I yeah. think she's wrong. And, and it's funny as like a non-African American person telling her that her experience is wrong right now. <laughs> But, but, but wrong in this very compassionate way as well. And like, she's actually, we're still good. We're, this is a continuing conversation I'm gonna have with her. But this is what I think is the difference. The difference is people now feel that are not black, that they have a foothold in the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. I think before when it first started out, I think people like me or you, it would be very difficult for us to wear a t-shirt that said Black Lives Matter. But this time it is so, the footage is so blatant that it almost transcends just Black Lives Matters. It's like injustice. There are some values that have been stepped on so royally that now it just seems like it seeps into all of our consciousness that we all have a right to be able to say this. And having that footing changes everything. Yeah, I l really love that. And I think the other thing that I have noticed, and you know, and it's not universal for sure, but, um, or, or nearly enough, but I also feel like, um, there's been a different expectation of the reasonably aware white response, if that's a fair thing to say. There's a different expectation. You know, I think about you and I are both members of the International Coach Federation. They didn't respond, you know, during Trayvon Martin. They didn't respond the first time, I don't think, you know, Black Lives Matter, all of that. Um, this time they responded. This time they put out a public declaration saying, you know, what happened is not okay. There's a different expectation. And I, I think there's this expectation that if you're a leader of any sort of organization right now, particularly in human development, leadership, anything like that, and you do not have anything to say, what the hell's wrong with you? Right? Yeah, I agree. I, I fully agree with that because I think it's an issue of the fact that you gotta have to you, you have to you have to say something. You have to speak out. There there is a voice that everyone you take a stand and your silence also says something as well. I think then is an issue of then how do you go about that? How do you navigate that if you are not black or how do you navigate well, you know in an intelligent way? And and maybe that's part of the you know, if we think about, well, where, I mean, this is something I think about a lot is, well, where are we in consciousness as a world? Like have, you know, have we shifted to a state in our language that would be more above the line? You know, are we encouraged? But I do see, um, I do think that that's some of the response that I'm seeing is by basically saying like, look, this might be the wrong thing to say, but let me try anyway. Yes. Um, and I do think there are a lot of people who still are stuck in fear, would love to say something, but they don't know, they don't know what to say. And I have to say, sorry, my, my apologies, and you may know the name and it's just is escaping me, but there's, you know, a huge part of this has been the impact of the book White Fragility and other books like that, mm -hmm. that have basically said, you know, let's talk about what you do need to say as a white person and what you need to not say. Yes, yes. I think you have to because the people in power and those influencers, you have to have their voice as well, right? The black community by itself, because of what's happening, they cannot speak just with their voice. They have tried for years now. And I think just in terms of like the freedom writers and the civil rights movements, you had whites riding on those buses, right? right. So right. show up. And if, if, it's, if it's taken the wrong way, then figure things out. Have a discourse about it. Be uncomfortable. Be, yes. You know, say the wrong thing. Offend people, but be in the conversation from, you know, I think the other thing, and I, I think this was one of the impacts for me of, of white fragility in that, is that, how do I want to say this? Sort of like, like, let go of the fact that you might have good intent if you fuck up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. Thank you for saying that. Um, yes. But like, it's not like, it's like, let go of like, but I'm a good person. And you know, I didn't mean to. It's like, just be responsible for the impact of what, of what you did or said. So, hey, question for you, you know, because you've hung out with us and been on a long journey around neuroscience and yeah. human development and all of that. I'm curious what you, like, what let's talk a little bit about what is the brain response in any of this you know like what is the 
brain response that creates race? What do you think, you know, creates racism or creates courage? Like, what are you seeing? Yeah, as soon as you say that, it makes me think of the movie Beauty and the Beast. Mm. So there's a song called The Mob Song, and that's when Gaston goes after the beast in the castle. And there's a line that says, um, we don't like what we don't understand. In fact, it scares us. And I think it's the, the fear of the unknown that creates that. So from level two, you go to level three. And so I really believe the fact that it's survival. Literally, if we cannot predict what someone else is going to do, it's going to make us afraid. So then the answer is knowledge, right? It's, it's a, how do you fight lack of knowledge with knowledge? It's, 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 it's an ignorance, right? And so then there's two types of ignorance. There's one that you kind of like choose to be ignorant because, and you know that, or you just don't care enough. But I think there's also where you are engaging in your ignorance, right? So how can you level five your ignorance, right? So if you can do that, then it shows at least the, for the other people that you care enough, right? I mean, I get those que that question all the time. Like, so I don't mean to offend you, but like, where are you from? Almost like knowing the fact that I've gotten that question enough. But the thing is, because I assume positive intent, I can handle that question. So it's really about finding people that can handle your ignorance and hold space for that. And if you can find people like that in your life, then you're truly blessed because it allows you to be able to grow out of your fear. Well, and I think, you know, when I think about, gosh, this is so, you know, it's just so layered because we are blessed by the people, you know, as for me, as a white person, I'm blessed by the people that have been patient with me when I have been ignorant, right? And have, you know, with kindness, basically said like that was an ignorant that was that was an ignorant thing to say i'm trying to think of a good example <laughs> there's probably so many good example and at the same time you know that's not a role that i want to put my friends in right like you are now responsible for my ignorance you know educate me and that like no my responsibility is to educate myself and yet the thing about the brain i want to say is that when it comes at us so this is like the awkward part. So help me out here. But when something comes at us and is just like a, any kind of feedback, I don't care if it's feedback as a leader or as a teacher or as a parent, but it just comes like you fucked up, you screwed up, like you, this was wrong and bad. You're a bad person. One of the things I know is the brain goes into threat response, right? It just goes into this like, ah. <gasps> And, and I believe that this comes from this feeling of like, I have gone against the tribe. Yes. And, right? And therefore, I'm not safe. Yep. And so it's really hard to stand in the face of that kind of feedback. You have to be very committed to your learning. And if you're not, you may just wipe it away might not have any impact at all because it's such a threat, right? Yes. Well, in fact, I actually was with you in Northern California during a training where this actually happened. Oh we my God, out, what happened? <laughs> I, I, went out, I went out to lunch with a bunch of my fellow training, you know, the people in the tra training, the workshop, and I had used a term and someone was not pleased with my term. And I totally didn't even know that it was bad at all. And you know what the word was? What was it? It was homosexual. Say it and again homosexual oh and they didn't want that they felt that it was too clinical sounding and that gay or lesbian was a more appropriate term and i didn't even know there was that connotation but the way that she prefaced it was i know that you are a person of right like of awareness and that you would never do it so she kind of like designed the alliance or reminded me of yeah. our like un unspoken alliance before then she interjected and then i was able to receive that from her in that way yeah, that's a, yeah, I know that you are, I know that you are a person good intent. So I think there is a, um, to me, there's a, there's, two, there's layers to this. So if I think about, especially in this arena, you know, as we are, as we are so, you know, one of the things I've become aware of, you see, even in the last three weeks is, is, you know, I actually have a fairly good education and I took a, you know, I took classes in the civil rights movement and I, you know, took classes in the Supreme Court and the decisions and all of that. And I'm re I'm not completely unaware. And there was all sorts of stuff I had no idea of, like really no idea. Like for example, that the police force was originally created to track runaway slaves. Yes. I was ignorant to that. No so, idea. No, like none at all. So like, okay. so. It's my responsibility to do two things, probably many more, but a couple of them. One is to continue to educate myself, to continue to pay attention to what are the resources where I can learn. 
And the second is to be non-defensive if somebody says, hey, by the way, right? I think that's, that's important. And then I also think that, and this is something I really hold in terms of giving any kind of feedback, I want my feedback to land. I want it to make a difference. I want it to be accessible. So I love what you're saying about this, making sure the other person can hear me. Yes. And yes. I think for, for some people, I know some white people and maybe people of color as well, you know, some of this is having conversations with people in their communities, in their families, and, you know, kind of not stepping over uh, various forms of racism. And part of, I think, the strategy is you want to be, sh you, you do want to see if people can hear you so that it doesn't just go on like Teflon. And that feels really awkward saying that. So tell me what you think. Yeah, I think part of it is relationship. I, I really, as a teacher, right? So rules without relationship lead to rebellion. And I think conversations that, conversations that do not have like, almost like sometimes when you get um, advice from someone, but like it wasn't, it, you didn't invite, you didn't welcome that. It's like, why are we, why are you saying this? Like you almost like pierced my like circle of trust. Like that was not, you know, like, don't let the vampire in. Like, I did not welcome you. And I think there's something to be said about that. You have to allow space where you know that you're prepared to hear that or the other person's prepared to hear that. Don't just plant seed when the, the soil hasn't been tilled. Don't start painting without primer. Is there a layer of primer before you start painting? And it's because without the primer, sometimes it doesn't stick. It feels. Right. Now, here's the paradox, I believe, because I also think you know, I also don't get to say, well, you didn't use primer. Yes. So I'm not going to listen because you weren't nice about it. Like, no, 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 I'm sorry. I don't have that right. And yet we also know from a brain standpoint that the conversation will be stickier if there is, re if there's relationship there and the person can hear you. But I don't have the right to be like, well, you didn't say it right. Well, this is where we have the little tool to, to scrape off paint as well. And that's, part, <laughs> that's part of compassion right? That we can make mistakes and then that's okay to have yeah. the relationship to do that. So you're a middle school teacher and yes. you work in a, you work in Riverside, California, which as I know has high free and reduced lunch and you have a very diverse student population. I am curious what you have done as a teacher to set values and norms to, you know, create an, I mean, I, I happen to know you were teacher of the year one year, you're a really good teacher. So I'm making an assumption here that you're pretty good at like setting classroom norms and creating a safe place for kids to learn. What are some of the things you've done? Yeah, sorry, do you hear music? I don't know why I feel like I hear music. I apologize. I don't know if it's coming from your side or my side, but, um, but, no. No. but I, I think part of it is the fact that from the very, very, very beginning. I, so here's an example. Here's an example that I said. On the very first day of school, I said what, that intro that you just said, like, I am, hi, my name is Mr. Sun. I'm Chinese, but I was born in Korea. And literally the kid said, ching chong, ching chong. That's the very first comment that the person made. Wow. And so what I said was, you are so fortunate that I am your teacher <laughs> because I have the patience to handle what you said, because in a different context, you would have gotten beaten up. Like someone would have hurt you. Yeah. So I think part of it is with, when it comes to teaching is to have the patience for ignorance, having the patience for that, that um, respecting the learning curve. So what you do is you have to allow people to have a growth mindset in even relation to things that they, you know, just think is funny or, or anything like that. And so I think that's part of it. So one of the things I did, especially in the past, is I talked about um, safety, support, and belonging. And I would set that up with something called HCA, which is Home Court Advantage. So because we're a part of the same team, then how do we build safety, support, and belonging? And part of the way we do that is to allow room for learning. And learning means the fact that you're going to fail. You're going to say things that you don't mean, or if you do, then we're going to, as a group, try to work it out. You know, and I think about, you know, sort of back to the brain, um, you know, man, it, you, you have, you, I, I hope you know you really are high on my hero list because <laughs> first of all, for who you are and the amazing teacher you are, but the fact that you go in there every day and you work with like 13 year olds is really, I think you're on a number of people's hero list. But it, you know, one of the things we know about the brain is that the part of the brain that is most cued to empathy can be one of the parts of the brain 
that develops later and sometimes quite late, like as late as mid twenties. And so you're, and sometimes it develops earlier, sometimes a little earlier for girls and boys, but you're, you know, I think about the comment when you said I'm Chinese, you know, to me, that's like a, uh, like, okay, that kid had no, he probably didn't even think, his brain isn't processing, how will this make Mr. Sun feel if I say this? He's just saying something in order to, you know, get a little giggle out of his classmates, right? So, but part of what we have to do with young people is we have to help them develop those empathy neural connections. We have to, re I mean, that is a, that is critical timing. And if they're in a, you know, if they're in like a, a school or a family or a part of the country where those things aren't being addressed, they don't make, they don't get to make those connections and they may, they may miss it and grow up into adults who basically have no capacity to see beyond their own little insular tribe. Does that make sense what I'm Yes, totally. I mean, it makes me think in terms of like, so learning takes place with, because of cognitive dissonance, right? So basically you, 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 un, you say something and you, that, that it goes against your own belief system and that doubt then causes it to disbalance and then you have to somehow regulate that back. And that's really what learning is. And so for me, I think it's an issue of allowing the kids to be themselves, bring what they bring. They're not a blank slate, like the old wit paradigm of educate or thinking and learning and allow that. And then, and then see whether or not by my by me just being myself like literally just being Shay that that alone automatically starts that disequilibrium I think what I mean by that is the fact that like they when a person sees me they see the fact that I'm Chinese like I can't get away from that right it's not like I can go to the closet and like put on a different color skin exactly there's no unzipping so yeah. one of the things that I do from the very beginning is I like have spider-man things all in my classroom and I would wear spider-man shirt and things like that but all of that is super intentional and the intentionality is I want to be remembered as the teacher on the first day of class is, so how was your first day of school? Oh, good. I have this teacher who loves Spider-Man. Or even I have this Chinese teacher who likes Spider-Man. But the focus isn't just like, I have a Chinese teacher. Because they, can re because they have a point of reference. They know who Spider-Man is, but they might not have an experience with an Asian man. So it allows for me to get in to their... To, to bring closeness. And so that intentionality is what I do, right? Because once they can accept me for being a fan of Spider-Man, mm -hmm. then they're like, wow, you know what? Maybe if, he's, if, he, if he likes what I like, maybe then we have more in common as well. And that right there becomes the key. I did not, I mean, I know that you love Spider-Man and I know that you were Spider-Man in the classroom. I did not know that that's, that how strategic that was in terms of working with their brain. And but yes, it was, that was an accident because my very first year of teaching, I didn't, I wasn't Spider-Man, I was Clark Kent. But Spider-Man came out like two, two years into my teaching and the phenomenon of that, that is what changed everything. So I would tell kids things like there'd be a spider in the class and I'd go and pick it up and throw it out the, the classroom. And the kids were like, you're not scared of spiders, Mr. Sun? I said, no. As a kid, I would pick up spiders in hopes that they would bite me so I could climb <laughs> on walls. I wanted the ability to climb on walls. See, that little naivete that I shared with them allowed them to go like, I'm naive and I think stupid things too, but Mr. Sun thinks stupid things and yet he's an adult and he's okay, right? So I think it's allowing the human side of it all. It's this, so it's this interesting, it's this interesting place. And this was part of the original inspiration for Ursula and I to host the series is that, you know, the seven levels are levels of effectiveness, they're levels of consciousness, they're, they're an increasing experience of oneness, we could say. But we didn't want to sort of look at this whole situation and say, well, it doesn't matter because at the spiritual level and at the soul level, we're all one right? Because that just felt really like ignorant and kind of offensive um, or really offensive. Like it's, but there is this interesting paradox of that we, we are part of the human race and yet we each have our own experience, some of which is being part, being part of another culture within that race. So, and I think that what you're talking about is creating these moments of connection where people can experience you as they actually let go of, oh, this Chinese identity and just connect with this human identity. Is that kind of, am I hearing you right? Yes, it's like we have links in our chain. Where can they link to my chain? <laughs> and start with that link. 
I love that. Okay. So we were talking earlier before we came on the call about, you know, we both like this neuroscience guy named Dan Siegel. And Dan Siegel uh, talks about integration and he integration in the brain, not in like busing integration. He's talking about his belief. And we really believe this at Be Above Leadership as well, that effectiveness is a function of integration. But he has a particular definition. So speaking of links in the chain, where he says integration is when you link differentiated elements. And I think about that as being the power. It's this paradox of saying we are dif we need to be able to be differentiated and be seen as the differentiation, as the difference, as the different history, as the different experience we are, but we need to also be able to link. Yes, totally. I, I think literally it's body parts. <laughs> my eye cannot do what the ear can do in my nose. They're all linked, but they're also one body, right? It's both and. It's a, it's a whole system. We've, we have different functions, and I think that our experiences, and all, I've struggled with my own identity quite a bit, and I believe, truly believe that there's been moments, there's been peaks in my life where I've actually had to step into the fact that I'm Chinese and that, that wasn't an accident. Because I remember in sixth grade, I wanted to be white yeah. because I couldn't integrate my identity. Because, and it wasn't about being white, it literally was about being a part of the larger community. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so for me, but whatever yeah. white represented, it wasn't. Yeah. No, if I was in Africa, I would have wanted to be black. Right. right? So right. like, so it was an issue about being a part of the greater culture. So that way I could know what the rules were. I can had a function, how to navigate. That's what it was about. Was it about also not always being seen as different? Maybe, but I don't know if was, that was super conscious because I didn't experience blatant racism like other kids. I think part of it is the fact that I'm a likable guy to, to be kind of like not so humble about because I, I but, but I think part of it is this, but likable in the sense that I find what we have in common, the like and not the difference. And because I kind of like projected that energy, that energy was reflected back to me. Instead of looking for the differences and kind of highlighting that, I would highlight like, hey, you're a student too. So I remember being in the, in the cafeteria uh, line, the, the lunch, and some kid cut in front of me. And this black girl came up, pushed the other kid out of the way, and said, you don't do that to Shay. <laughs> so some of my experiences with the black population has been so profound that I joke with my ex-girlfriend that I want a coffee table book that's entitled Black People Love Me. And basically, it's pictures of me hugging people, black people in different major cities in the United States with a caption about the relationship I have with them. And, I'm, and this is a true, this is just a statement of fact. So check this out, because I believe it is true. If I meet someone who's black, who actually does not, has ill intent, I will process that and, be, and play it off like that was just that one guy. And right. they continue with the expectation that black people still love me. So it's an issue of, you know, where you, what, what is it? Uh, where, your, where your focus goes, your, your energy flows. So my energy is like, people like me, if you're different from me, you're still gonna like me. And because they receive that, that acceptance, that, that unconditional like, hey, like it's open arms, instead of like, no, we are different. I think honestly, that's a part of it. Yeah. That is, that is really cool. But you're talking about, you know, the brain, you know, one of the things we know about the brain is that it's very, very primed to conserve energy, right? Yes, yes. You know, it wants to just, there's so much that it's doing that anywhere it can cut ex energy expenditures, it will. It's like your dad turning off the lights to keep the meeting, <laughs> to keep the light bulb down. I think of my brain like that, like, let's turn off the lights there. And one of the things it does is that's why we have bias, right? Because if I can just run on an assumption or a bias, I don't have to expend energy. So you're saying you're by, you don't have to think about if you meet a black person, do they let you know, am I, am I okay or not? Because you've already shut those lights out. And it's like they like me. Oh my gosh. This is a crazy story, but I was at a, a, an office max and this big, probably over six feet, huge black guy comes up to me. And he says, hey, uh, do you know how to install printer ink? I'm like, I probably could figure it out. And he's, I said, why? He says, because I don't know how to do it. Would you come to, back to my house and install it for me? So I said, let me go check with my, my wife. 
And I went out to the parking lot. Hey, Teresa was out there with Anna. And I said, hey, this is this guy who wants me to install his printer ink. Are you cool with that? She's like, okay, I'll follow. And I go to this black man's house. And his wife is there. And I go upstairs. And I set up his printer ink. And afterwards, he says, you know, thank you so much. I, I just felt like I could go to you and ask you to do this. Is there anything that you need? And says, and, and he says, I'm willing to go on a call with you and just like talk. And, so, and so literally that night, we had this hour long conversation about spiritual matters. But so when I tell you that I send off this energy. <laughs> they do, they're taking no. you out of Best Buy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right? Like that is incredible, right? So, so granted, you could say that that's naive, that's dangerous, but I never felt that because my intuition would have kicked in. So yeah. my brain did not go into fight or flight. Instead, it went into like, something way larger than that. It went way above the line. Yeah, so, so you know, thinking about kind of back to the seven levels, and maybe we'll sort of wrap up with this. If you think about what is the response, excuse me, to, you know, what is the response to this difficult issue of race, particularly in America? We know actually there's issues worldwide. Um, we're focusing on America right now because of what just happened in Minneapolis. But, you know, what is the response from the highest level of consciousness? What's the, you know, what is really the most spiritual response in your, in your view? Yeah, actually, I've, I've, I've struggled with this one because I told you that um, my immediate reaction was fear, anger, this is not okay, yeah. and so forth, right? So again, so, so knowing the fact that, that was my starting point, I knew the fact that I wasn't doing a spiritual bypass. I knew the fact that it wasn't just like a straight, like, everything will be okay, this is perfect, what will love do type of situation. So the analogy I came up with that really served me was a forest fire, that for, forest fires happen. And it doesn't matter if it's rioting or looting or protesting, but eventually this is not gonna go on forever. And then once it dies down, there will be cleanup. And then after that, we will have to try to regrow things. And then, so then it's an issue of then how do we clean up the brush? How do we use control burning so that this, these events are not as catastrophic, you know, not so big. So really what I did was I went into an observer mind and I really kind of like went up and really just try to see this from the highest perspective as possible to almost remove the label of American, to remove the labels of even like the, the year 2020. And just start removing those, those labels really helped me to be able to see this as a human experience. Once I could tap into that this is a human experience and that this is not novel to our own time period, it somehow allowed me to have more space to hold for, for injustices like this. And then after in that space, then returning back to this is not right. Right? Like it's a both and, yes. Yeah, it's the permission to sort of be this spiritual being having this human experience. Yes. Both. And I love that you said not the spiritual bypass. Like it'll all be one, you know, it's all in the hands of God. And yet that's true. And it's also true there's human people in pain that need help. And, you know, I think about this. So what do you, I'm curious, you talk about this, this great analogy of a forest fire, which we also know like, nobody wishes a forest fire to happen, but we also know there can be a purpose in sort of the balancing of nature. And we feel terrible for the animals that are harmed or killed or, or people or, you know, people who lose things. And at the same time can understand it's kind of cleared things out or even allowed seeds to pop. What do you think the controlled burn in the metaphor is like, how do we do that as like, what is that like, in practical ways, am I making sense? Like, what is the equivalent of the controlled burn that we should be doing? So the, in parenting, there's two main types of parenting that I've heard of, immunization and isolationism. So when you isolate a kid from things that you don't want them to do, it creates curiosity, wonder, and actually does not go very well. So when I was in elementary school, um, I thought smoking was really cool because like my aunts and uncles and my parents' friends were smoking. And so my mom was like, you think smoking is cool, huh? I said, yeah, I do, it's awesome. So she said, smoke the cigarette. And she made me smoke a whole cigarette. After that, I, did never, I never had a desire to smoke again. So my whole point in saying that is that I think there needs to be controlled uncomfortableness. Yeah. Allow yourself a space where it's safe to have moments where you're in a situation that you don't feel totally comfortable with. That, that means literally going on a Zoom call. Like I was saying uh, an interview just with my high school, with a student who was in eighth grade who's, who just graduated from high school. I said, could you imagine if right now every uh, cop who has a bias towards Af certain African-Americans in certain uh, communities, all 
were um, instructed to go on a Zoom call for one hour a week <laughs> with someone in that group. And you had to choose someone in that group who also has a di disdain for cops, but both share a willingness. That is a controlled burn. Yeah, you know, you make me think of, there's a guy, and I can't, his name is not coming to mind right now, but he started, he's an African-American guy in the South, and he started taking the Ku Klux Klan out to lunch. Do you yes. know this story? Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's a controlled bird. Yes. Like, hey, we're going to, I'm buying you lunch. And I'm, you, you're making me think of just the, will, the, the willingness to be curious and uncomfortable, and even say to some of our friends, like, what is it about your experience that I don't know? What is it that's been hard for you simply because of your skin that I don't know about? You know, that you, that I want to, I want to hold that with you. I want to know you more. Um, and we were talking earlier about crossing that bridge of friendship to really develop that deep empathy where we can feel for each other. And I think this is part of what gets, what, what creates racism is this this inability to feel past our own group oh totally i i mean i don't go to church like i used to and things like that but i saw i'm highly influenced by by jesus and when jesus talks about bringing the children to him or to because the kingdom of god belongs to them i think it goes back to zen buddhism actually <laughs> and to beginner mind i think if all of us step back into a beginner childlike mind i think we would actually be able to see more of the same than the differences because as children we can be friends with people because we're like hey you like play-doh i like play-doh you like legos i like legos right and so i think that and then we learn the differences so yeah. i think i think if all of us just became more childlike and that's why i honestly believe that curiosity and wonder mm. is more powerful than we really give credit to. I gave blood yesterday and the lady was like, why do you look so young? And she's like Asian herself, right? She's like Filipino. And I said, but besides me being Asian, which is not the only reason, it's in my blood. And I said that because my, my blood type is B positive. And I believe that, <laughs> I believe that in, in, in positivity is actually my second uh, Gallup talent theme yeah. also, my strength. But I think being positive for me means that my child stays less than the victim. My child archetype of brattiness is, takes a back seat. And I feel that my playful, happy child comes up. And what makes my happy child happy is that every day is a new day and every person is a new person. And because of that, I engage them in that like wonder, like, I want to know more about you. And this is why I love coaching, because people come to me and it's like, here's something about me. And I think that if we all kind of like open our hearts, open our minds, open our doors, like in Chinese, one of the, the, the words for happiness is kai xin, which literally means open heart. And oh. I think if we all had just a slight opening, even if it's a jar for some of us, but one person can crack that. Mm. Oh my gosh, I think the floodgates of compassion, of love, of synchronicity, mm. I think we will receive more than we will ever have gained. Mm, that's beautiful. Well, thank you so much. And I know um, you guys don't all know this, but one of the things that Shay does is he brings the seven levels, this idea of effectiveness and the brain to these amazing middle schoolers and gets them thinking about things in this way from a really young age. And I know they're never going to get over it. They'll never forget it. I and, and I texted you a photo of one of the, the student who carried the seven levels little cart in his wallet. And it's been four years yeah. and he still pulls it out and he talks to his girlfriend about it. Yeah, it, it's a model. It's not the only model, but it's a model that I think helps us think about how do we live more as a contribution to the world. And so, um, like I said, you're one of my heroes. Thank you so much for all your wisdom and Thank your you, generosity Anne. Thank today. You. Much appreciated. Thank to be you. continued, hopefully. <laughs> yes, definitely. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.